good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all here. You're very welcome to our worship service and to uh, uh, our communion service where we gather around the Lord's table. A uh, great delight and privilege to, do, to be able to do that. Um, there are some announcements, so I'll just I'll take a wee run through those first. Um, first of all, the, the midweek Bible study and prayer meeting will be this Wednesday, uh, 2nd of February, at uh, Kilkenna Murray. We're still going on, we're still streaming on Zoom. We'll continue that. We will probably get to a point, I said this earlier in Drumgill, where we'll have to review the streaming services as things relax, you know, but I know people have got used to it and it's a good ministry, so we'll have to, we'll have to work our way through it. I think all, all congregations and churches are the same with this new technology, you know. So anyway, could it continue that way on via, you know, Zoom in the midweek for the meantime. Um, BB meets tomorrow, um, that's Monday the 31st January, it'll be Anchor Boys between 7 and 8, yeah. And um, they continue to meet then alternative Mondays, Anchor Boys one Monday and then the older ones, uh, Junior and Company the next uh, until things relax. So uh, BB also needs helpers, so if you can help out with that uh, work, uh, you'd be very uh, welcome to do that and I'm sure Ian would be delighted to, to hear from you. Um, also then GB meets on the Friday um, and um, GB, it'll be uh, the older ones, will be seniors and brigaders this week. And it's, remind me of the times, I haven't got the time here. Uh, do you know, it's 7, 7.15? No, it is 7.15 too. It's the same times, isn't it? It's BB, it has different times. Yeah, so um, it's, um, yeah, 7.15 to 8.15. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Okay, so... Um, then we're hoping to hold communicants classes if, you, if you're interested in that. If you want to come forward for that or want to explore that, let me know. Uh, I'll probably be starting, maybe not this week, but next. And probably we'll hold the communicant classes on Sunday afternoon. It'll be the simplest time for everybody, you know, um, sort of at three o'clock. Um, so, you know, just let me know if you would want to partake of that, you know, or in, be involved in that. Um, then, um, just looking down this, some of these are from Gilland and some are. Uh, yes, Little Acorns meets Drumgillen Church Hall this Wednesday. Uh, that's right, isn't it? Yes. So um, contact uh, between 9.45 and 11.15. And um, contact Beryl or Alison or Sandra if you're interested uh, in putting your name down to, to be at that. still name. It's still by registration rather than just coming along. So it, you have to put, put your name down for it. Um, so then just to say that there, is, um, there has been an ongoing restriction uh, in our meetings, as we know, but they're easing the restrictions, and um, the following guidance was issued from Church House. Basically, I'll summarise it just that um, face coverings may now be removed when members of the congregation are in a pew, so you can take off your face masks. But here's, <laughs> here's the, you know, uh, but you must put them back on and wear them when you're singing. So um, it's a wee bit of a, you know, like take, take your mask off and put it on, take your mask, you know. So, uh, I mean, we're not, we're, not, we're not a police authority here. We're not going to police this, but, you know, that's the rule. So if you, if you, you don't have to wear your face mask when you're sitting in the pew anymore. Um, that's interim, so that uh, sometime in the middle of, um, I don't have the date, February, they're going to review it again and ease it again. So it's, this is sort of like an interim thing. So I think it's starting to phase out the, the face mask sort of thing. But of course, it's, we'll leave that to your discretion, um, but you can sit in the pew now without them. Um, so that's it. I, I, I don't think there's anything else, unless I've missed something, Mervyn, but I think that's, yeah. So I um, want to open with uh, Psalm 1, which is kind of like the gateway into the Psalms. Um, uh, it's a wonderful Psalm. Um, it, it sort of incorporates all the different categories of Psalms in, in one small Psalm, in a sense. Um, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor seats, or sorry, sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in, in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff, the wind drives away. The wicked, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, 
but the way of the wicked will perish. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing our first, our opening praise, which is a psalm, Psalm 116. It should be a familiar tune, um, and it's verses 13 to 19. Use them in the meantime, yeah, that's fine. No problem. Uh, it should be him books there. So it's uh, Psalm 116. Um, and, oh, we got it. We got it. We got it. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have gathered here today to praise you, to give you glory, to worship you, to give you the praise of our hearts as we gather around the table of our Lord Jesus. Thank you for that privilege and opportunity. And we acknowledge, Lord God, that you alone are worthy of praise, that you are the Lord of all, that you are the mighty and living God who is the judge of all the earth and the one to whom all are accountable and must give account. So it is that we can praise you this morning in Jesus Christ without fear, because, Heavenly Father, you have redeemed us through the blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus. And you have spread this table before us so that we can partake of Christ through the bread and the wine which speak of his body broken of us and his blood shed for us. So help us now, Lord God, as we worship together to give you glory and as we gather around the table and uh, help us to glorify and honor you as the one who has saved us and who transforms us and who makes us new in Christ. We confess today, Heavenly Father, that we are those who have lived our lives in such a way as that we pander to self and to our own selfish desires. We are those who have failed so often in our relationships, and we confess that we have spoken wrongly to and about others, uh, that we are those who have allowed resentment, Lord God, to and malice to take root in our hearts. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, and help us to put away such things, that we may know the blessedness of living for you, 
and that, Lord Jesus, we might be conformed in our lives to your pattern, to your image. And so we pray these things and ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So our Bible reading then is from um, Colossians chapter 3 and it's verses 5 through to 11. So Colossians 3 and verses 5 to 11. Let's hear the word of God. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and in all. Amen. And may the Lord our God bless to our hearts and minds that reading from scripture, from his holy and inerrant word. So uh, Arthur, good to see a few boys and girls out this morning. And... um, Great to see you. Um, got a wee picture to put up there if, there if we have one. If we don't, it's okay. Yep. Um, just um, what is that I got up on the screen there? Anybody? Yes. A it's a what? A it's a jacket. Yes. In fact, does it maybe it looks a wee bit like a coat, does it? Yeah, yeah a coat. Yeah. And um, do you have a coat? Yeah. Good. Good boy. Um, and uh, do you, I take it you all probably have coats. Yeah, yeah, they all have coats, yeah. Um, and uh, when do you wear a coat? Yes? When it's raining. When it's raining, exactly right. When it's raining or it's cold or wet or whatever, you wear a coat. Um, and, you know, maybe you now it's a cold day today, you might just wear a coat to keep warm. Um, and uh, maybe you wear a coat out to church as well, yeah. I, I wear my, I don't have my coat there, but... I have a nice warm coat that has a fleece in it. You can unzip the fleece in the summertime, you know, and wear the fleece separately and all. I like it. It's really, really warm. Um, so, yes, coats are important. Um, it's important to wear a coat. It keeps, keeps you warm and it keeps you dry. And, um, you know, it, it, in, in cold weather like this, uh, this time of year, we, we wear our coats. And we all have worn a coat at some time or other. And when it's bad weather, you might say, or your mum might say, your mum ever say to you, put on your coat. Yeah, put on your coat. If you're going out there, you put on your coat, right? So, um, because it's cold out there. Um, And you can just get your coat, put it on, zip it up, uh, straight forward, and you go out and you you stay warm and dry. And you know why I'm thinking about that? About putting on your coat and maybe your scarf and whatever else. Because the Bible passage we read talks about putting on and taking off, like clothes. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who is Jesus' servant to preach about Jesus and his, his truth, says, put on the new self. Um, and he says, you know, put off the old and put on the new self. And what he's saying there is that, you know, when you trust in Jesus, your sins are forgiven, right? You need to trust in the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. But then... God also wants you to to put on Jesus. That is the beauty and the nature and the loveliness of Jesus and what he's like. The Lord wants you to put on that. Um, And God helps us to do that, to become like Jesus um, by giving us the Holy Spirit to make us more like him. And you know, kids, and you know all of us here, God forgives our sins when we trust in Jesus because Jesus died for our sins. But God also then, the gospel, the good news is that God also helps us to become more and more like Jesus, to put on Jesus and to live like Jesus. Um, You know, like if you have dirty old clothes, you put them on, you put something new on in their place. And we take off the dirty, filthy rags of our sin 
in our lives and we put on the lovely clean robes of Jesus and his beauty and his glory and, and we live and be like him. And that's what God wants for us all. And that's one day when we go to be with Jesus and in the new creation, we will be perfect like him. So that starts now and God wants us to live like Jesus and to put on Jesus. Okay, so look, thank you so much for listening. Um, and we're going to sing, um, I'm going to sing your hymn, um, which is uh, 270, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. We're all familiar, I think, with the, the idea of, you know, the decisive victory, you know, like um, whether it's in sport or, you know, maybe in politics, like you get a, 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 an election landslide, and it's a decisive victory for a political party or, or politician or whatever, or, um, you know, on the battlefield, um, you know, there are events and there are victories that represent kind of decisive turning points in human affairs. Um, it's interesting that in both world wars, First and Second World War, there were decisive victories which, you know, made a turning point or marked a turning point which led, in the end, in both cases, to the defeat of Germany. Um, you know, the First World War, I suppose we would probably think of D-Day um, and maybe the defeat of Rommel in North Africa and other decisive turning points. And in the First World War, which had been characterized by, you know, on either side been able to attain a decisive victory over the others, at least on the Western Front, um, and all the horrors of trench warfare and that sort of static kind of war. Um, the decisive victory on the Western Front and the turning point for the Allied powers was the Battle of Amiens in, in 1918, later known as the Hundred Days Offensive, um, in which the Allied powers then advanced 11 kilometers in one day, which for the First World War was quite something. Um, and the morale of German troops began to collapse and then they began to surrender in huge numbers to the Allied forces. Um, 
and basically it was all over. Uh, and interestingly, the key in that battle was the use for the first time in large numbers of tanks, you know, mechanised mobile warfare, which ironically then the Germans used in the Second World War to great effect in their Blitzkrieg tactic. Um, but, you know, there are decisive victories that are turning points. And the reason why I start by saying that is that what the Apostle Paul is presenting to us in this passage, uh, and in, in Colossians generally, and in his writings generally, uh, and is presented to us in the preceding verses, we didn't read them, but is the great truth that the, the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has given to us a remarkable victory. It is a decisive turning point in human affairs and in human history. Um, a victory which represents a turning point for us. A victory which is ours simply through faith in Christ. Paul tells the Colossians that through faith in Christ, the believer is united with Christ by the Holy Spirit, made to be one with Jesus in his death, so that the believer, through the power of the Holy Spirit, dies to the old self, the old sinful nature, and the old life, and is raised with Christ into newness of life. Salvation in Christ brings forgiveness, the forgiveness of sin, but also it, it brings with it a whole new order of covenant life in the new covenant through being united to Christ as our Savior. That's part of the gospel that is, I don't think, ever really preached enough, or not preached enough, I was going to say never really preached, but it, it's not emphasized really. The gospel is forgiveness of sins through faith in the Lord Jesus, absolutely true. But the gospel is also that God saves us from the reality, power, presence, and dominion of sin in our lives. That's the gospel too. That's good news as well. That, you know, God doesn't leave us to languish in that which, the guilt of which he saved us from, but he saves us from the power of sin as well, from all of the impact of sin. And, you know, salvation brings a whole order of covenant, new covenant life, enabled by the grace of God and through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And that great truth then leaves us as believers, if we are true believers, with the imperative or the necessity of living out that new order of covenant life in our lives. And Paul deals with that in this passage. And there's a wee bit of a paradox, isn't there? A big bit of a paradox in the Christian life. That, you know, while we have this new life in Christ, which is wonderful, exhilarating, as Paul puts it, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Yet we still live in the flesh, in this fallen world with our fallen nature, uh, with the corruption of our old nature. But because of our new life in Christ, our, our old sinful nature is present, but it no longer reigns, but it's still there to vex and trip us up and to overwhelm us at times. But our sin nature our sin within the believer, which is still present in this world, in this life, is a bit like a deposed monarch. Still there, still potent, still working hard, still has the agenda, uh, working hard to debilitate us, but yet no longer able to rule and reign and dictate in the way it did previously. And so in these verses, verses 3 to 11 of Colossians, Paul encourages us to live according to the new. To take that remarkable victory of the Lord Jesus through his cross and resurrection, his living, his dying and rising for us in our place and begin to live that out in our lives. So I want to take a few moments as we you know, approach the Lord's table just to look at how Paul encourages us to do that, to live out that new order of life through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And Paul presents us in this passage with, with two key commands or imperatives. In verse 5 he says, put to death. And in verse 8 he says, put away or rid yourselves, is the NIV translation. 
And in each case, he presents a list of, of kind of vices or sins which characterize our old nature. And I want to look at the passage that in, in order that we can see what Paul's advice and exhortation is here about living in, in the new way, in this new order of covenant life. Paul, as I say, provides a, a list of sins and vices in verses 5 to 6, which I suppose we, we need to kind of just brush over. Um, and they, they relate to lust um, and our, our manifestations, really, of our earthly nature, our sinful fallen nature. Um, and all believers struggle. with. Uh, otherwise, Paul wouldn't be writing to these, these folks and saying, put these things away and put them to death if they weren't a problem in, in, in the life of believers. So, you know, uh, this is not a council of perfection. Um, so, yeah, this isn't a council of perfection. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's... it's advice and exhortation as to how we should be living. And the emphasis in this list here in verse, verses 5 and 6 is on sexual immorality and lust. Uh, indeed, the first listed there is sexual immorality um, coming from the Greek word pornea, from which we get our word pornography, actually, um, which just meant sexual immorality in general. Any form of sexual conduct outside of heterosexual marriage was pornea. Um, Following on from that, uncleanness or impurity. And following on from that, passion or, or literally lust. Um, and they all, you can see, follow that basic theme. Um, however, the meaning kind of broadens towards the end of the list there. So evil desires refers to inordinate desire generally. Uh, and the last one, greed or covetousness, um, is in a sense a kind of summary vice which is, is the root from which all the other selfish desires grow. Um, you know, the, the, the love of filling oneself with one's own pleasures and, uh, and satisfactions. Um, and, and, and I suppose that greed or covetousness refers to the uncontrolled and, and insatiable desire to have more in that general sense, especially what is forbidden. Um, the inappropriate desire for more experiences, more pleasures, etc., etc. And we all, folks, know, and this is true of everybody that's sitting here, we all know what it is to experience and be controlled by selfish desire. It's, you're, you're born in sin, and we, I and you are born in sin, and we know what that is, and we know what it is to experience that and be controlled by selfish desires. Even the secular world recognizes it in its own secular way, you know. Um, but, the, you know, in our society, the, it, you see it manifested generally in this sort of I want, I want, give me, give me kind of attitude to life. It's all around us. Uh, and in our age, you know, with the constraints of traditional Christian morality gone, uh, physical lust and desire has been normalized. Uh, to the point where we as Christians are seen as prudish, maybe even cruel and uninterested in human happiness because uh, we believe in the sanctity of heterosexual marriage. But the truth is that that me-me way of living, that following mindset of pandering to desire and greed and passion and, you know, lust and following our passions and that greedy way of living for self-indulgent pleasure comes from godlessness. It is godlessness. And it is enslaving and it is self-destructive. And you can see the effects of it all around us. But through the gospel, the good news of our salvation, through the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus God saves us from that sinful way of living. He saves us from the guilt and the shame of it, but he also saves us from the power of it and the dominion of it in our lives. And so Paul says, put to death these things. Put these things to death. And the phrase put to death, it refers back to what he, we didn't read it, but what he says in verses 1 to 4 there, that, you know, we were raised with Christ, verse 1. And verse 3, he says, we have died with Christ. 
So Paul is saying that if you have died with Christ through trusting in him as your Lord and Savior and being united to him in faith, through faith, um, and you've been raised to newness of life through salvation, then you have died to what you were and you've become new in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is not, so what Paul's saying for us to do here is not just like moralism. It's not like, you know, do this and don't do that. It's not like here's a list of do's and don'ts. It's, it's a lot more than that. It's more than moral effort. But it, it is that for those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus and walk with the Lord Jesus, there is through the cleansing and sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit a new life and a new dynamic in our lives. There is, says Paul, a power in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus which changes our present earthly life as believers, a transformative power which operates within those who trust in Jesus through the fellowship and presence of the Spirit. Because we are in union with Christ through faith, so we now live in the realm or the sphere, if you like, of the life of the risen Christ. That's, that should be true of all believers. And for Paul, this truth that we are now in Christ and have died and been raised with him into newness of life is not some sort of abstract principle. This is not abstract theology here. It's not some ivory tower academic exercise he's talking about here. For him, this is who Christ is and this is who we are now in Christ and this is the impact and the implication for us as we live our Christian lives. This is what should be in the life of believers. And in order to emphasize how imperative it is that we live out this transformed reality, that this transformed reality is seen in us in, in our Christian lives, in our, in our <coughs> walk as, as believers, um, uh, and that we live as citizens of heaven, he reminds us in verses 6 and 7 of what we have been delivered from. Paul mentions here the coming wrath of God to make his point. I don't think he's saying here he's raising the wrath of God as a threat to the Colossians or to any true believer, but he's reminding them and he's reminding you and me that it is because of that sinful way of life, those passions and um, desires that he's been talking about here, that the wrath of God is coming upon unbelievers, on those who are disobedient. What Paul is really reminding us, uh, us of here in verses 6 and 7 is the seriousness of sin. What he's really saying here is, why, if we have been saved from the wrath that comes through that kind of behavior, would we want to continue in it? Do you understand? He's saying if you're, if you're in Christ and you, you are forgiven the guilt of your sin, why would you want to continue to live according to that which brought that judgment upon you in the first place from which you have been released? Why if, 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 if you have been saved from the wrath that comes through that kind of behavior, would you want to continue in it? Why would any believer want to continue in the behavior and life that was leading to such dire consequences and from which they have been saved? And so Paul is getting us here to see the seriousness of sin. Kind of like jolting us into sobering us up, you know. He's getting us to see the seriousness of sin from the divine perspective, from God's perspective. He's also saying, you have a, a reason to live differently now. You have the Spirit of God. You've died to that which held you and are raised into newness of life. And I suppose, you know, folks, the, the fact of God's wrath, that, that God's wrath is coming upon people because of their lustful and selfish living should make us as believers see how reprehensible such behavior is in God's sight. We of all people should know that. 
Which is why I hate all this cheap grace gospel stuff that preaches forgiveness but no change of life. I just think it's totally unbiblical, totally ungodly, completely against Christ and anything that is true and right under heaven. And actually, if we as believers want to see, if you want to see what the wrath of God means most clearly, if you and I want to see that, to see what my sin truly deserves in terms of wrath, then all we have to do is look at the cross. For it is when we look to Christ dying on the cross that we see, that I see the wrath of God against my sin because it's not his sin that put him there, it's my sin. And, and, and that shows us what our sin really means and is. When Christ cries out in our place, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is an incentive to turn away from the old life and to live to Christ in the power of our new life in him. And in verse 8 then, Paul provides us with another list of sins or vices. And these really relate to, I, generally to speech and, and conduct, you know, uh, particularly speech in relation to how we relate to one another. The first three listed, anger, rage or wrath and malice, are really those attitudes that give rise to hasty and nasty speech. Uh, the first of them translated anger refers to a, a deep-seated, smoldering resentment. The second, rage, refers to quick temperedness or outbursts of anger. Malice, literally wickedness, is, I'll give you the lexical definition of it, a quality of wickedness with the implication of that which is harmful and damaging. Namely, you know, you'd say about a person, they have a badness in them towards others and which hurts and harms others, you know, sort of badness. Um, you know, such things are of the devil. And, you know, we need, we're all, we all fall, fall prey to these things, but such things are of Satan. They are not of God and they should not be in our lives. The term slander is there is the same word that we get our word blasphemy from, you know, the dishonoring of God's person. But here it refers to the dishonoring and defaming of people. The term, you know, the, the, that sense of, you know, where we speak in a way that runs other people down, that, that lies and, about other people, that, that speaks maliciously against them. Um, that, that is pure wickedness, and Paul is describing it here as a sin of the flesh and something that comes from Satan. The term filthy language simply refers to vulgar and shameful speech. So we get the, you know, I don't want to labor this, but we get the general idea, don't we? And, and so the Christian view of speech and conduct and how we relate to each other is that our speech should be an instrument for honoring the Lord and the blessing of others. And it's, you know, why does he list these here? It's possible that these things were an issue in the Colossian church. We don't know the exact, you know, um, detail of, of what was going on in these churches that Paul was writing to. So he, maybe he lists them because he knows there's an issue there in the Colossian church. Um, <coughs> excuse me, but these problems of anger and resentment and speaking slanderously and maliciously concerning others, spreading rumors and gossip and slander and all that nonsense, it affects all churches. And it is of Satan and not of God. And people who do that and claim to be Christians, you know, and have done that throughout the ages, there are plenty of them who claim to be Christians and they're now in hell because they've shown by their language and their speech and the way they behave that as much badge wearing about Christ as they had in their lives, they have none of it in their hearts. And, you know, 
that's how serious this is. And we need to take these things seriously. And what Paul um, says to us here, we need to take seriously. The comment then at the beginning of verse 9 concerning lying um, is to be taken, taken in the sense of uh, never lie to each other because false speech is, is another way in which the health of the Christian community is adversely affected. So the imagery then that, that Paul uses here in verses 9 and 10, you know, in regard to all of these sort of things is, is like I was saying to the kids, it it's relates to the idea of a change of clothing. Uh, taken, taken, taken off verse 9 and put on. And that's his advice as to how we deal with this. Um, that we put off these things and we put on the new. Um, you know, it's true to say that we can tell a lot about a person by their, their dress, isn't it? By what they wear. In ordinary working life, um, whether it's a, an office worker or a shop worker or a professional or a businessman or a laborer, we can tell a lot about a person by the clothes they wear. Um, and the reason for that is that the people dress consistently with their vocation and their, their, their role and their job. Um, even in terms of fashion, we can tell a lot about a person by how they dress. And Paul is telling us here that we as believers must dress ourselves in a particular way, that we must um, clothe ourselves spiritually with a new identity that is visible and, and tangible and seen. That we must clothe ourselves spiritually with our new identity in Christ. That we must put on the new, that we must clothe ourselves with Christ. Uh, and that means putting off the filthy rags of our old nature uh, and our old sinful self uh, and putting on the new. As Paul tells us in, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. And, you know, you might say to me, well, you know, that's all very well. Uh, you know, um, I don't feel very different a lot of the time. Um, my old sinful self and my old habits die hard. And... Um, how am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to do this? And I think the answer here lies in what Paul says. You know, how do you put off the old and put on the new? The answer lies in verse 10 when he speaks, uh, Paul speaks about the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created him. The word renewed, anakino, means to cause something to be new and different in the sense of superior, becoming superior. And it's in the Greek here, it's in the passive present tense. This is what God does in us. And it's through, as Paul says here, knowledge. It is through the knowledge of Christ that this happens. It is through our deepening knowledge of and fellowship with the Lord Jesus as we read the scriptures day by day, as we live in fellowship with him, as we pray, as we fellowship with one another here on a Sunday morning and in the midweek, that is how it is. That is how God does this. And it's done by him within us through his word and by his spirit. As we walk with our Lord Jesus in faith and obedience, as we grow in the knowledge of him through his word, we are being renewed then by the spirit of God and the will of God and the grace of God in the image of our creator in the image of Jesus Christ, who is our creator and our redeemer. We are being renewed in, in his knowledge through our knowledge of him and by the presence and help of the Spirit. We deepen in our knowledge of Christ then through his word. So are we those for whom that is true and real? that we are deepening in the knowledge of Christ through the regular reading of scripture and prayer and fellowship. Peter says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, like newborn infants, 
long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, into salvation. The goal of the believer is to be conformed more and more to the image of Jesus. That is his ministry to us. It's what he does in us through his word and by his spirit. And this happens to us through the word of God and through taking the sacrament which preaches and proclaims the gospel to, it, to us. It is a, a gospel and covenant sign for us which uh, the spirit ministers to our hearts. But the word of God, folks, should be central to our lives and that growth through the word of God. And I just want to finish by, by saying this, that, you know, this is our goal as Christian believers, to be conformed more and more to the image of Christ. It is the purpose of God to make all who belong to him like Christ. And one day when we see him as he is in glory, we will be absolutely and perfectly in his likeness. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29 Paul says, for whom he foreknew, he, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. It is the destiny of all believers to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And that has implications for us now in how we relate to each other and how we live. Because Christ indwells all believers. And so we should be, be changed and transformed. And our relationships with each other changed and transformed as well. That's why Paul speaks here, as he does, of those distinctions at the end in verse 11. Um, giving us perhaps a little snapshot of the Colossian church in the first century. Um, he speaks of, you know, Jew, Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. Um, the early church is made up of a whole spectrum of people from different walks of life, and social distinctions in those days were very, very uh, defined. You know, slave and free, they, they say that about 30% of the Roman Empire was made up of slaves, and they were the laboring class, and, you know, treated as chattels, as objects. And here you have a church where you have slaves, and maybe their masters or freedmen, all mixing together as one people equally in Christ. Jew and Gentile together in a way they would never have been before. Um, Scythians, barbarians, barbarians and Scythians were regarded as a perfect example of unrefinement and savagery to the Greek and Roman world. So they were kind of like, you know, the barbarians like. And they're all here together in this church. And Paul is saying it doesn't matter because you're not what those distinctions tell you that you are you are now in Christ and you are a new creation in Christ and a new humanity in Christ and that's what they are and that's what we are when we come become believers so we leave all the baggage at the door God has purposed all of us to be conformed to the image of Jesus as one new people so let's be encouraged to live our lives in that way in such a way as to put off the old and put on the new, to live that victory out in our lives through walking and living day by day in the power of the risen Christ. And let that be something that transforms our relationships with one another as well. And as we gather around the Lord's table, then let's go out of here seeing the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus applied to our lives as well in transformative power. So we're going to sing... Um, and we're going to, um, yeah, our next item of praise, which is 552. So I have the drum gold and hymn down here so accidentally. So uh, take my life and let it be, I think.
This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is open to all who know and who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We therefore invite uh, all who love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity and truth to come and join us in this Holy Communion. If you don't feel that that is you, then, or that describes you, then just uh, let the elements pass you by. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Beloved in the Lord, listen to the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I received from the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As the Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and wine, so we take these elements of bread and wine to be set apart from all common use for the special and holy purpose to which he appointed them. As the Lord Jesus gave thanks and prayed, Let us follow his example. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do acknowledge you as the eternal and living God who is the creator of all things, who made us in your own image and whose mercies are upon all your works. And we thank you, we praise you, living and mighty God, for the grace and for the mercy that we receive through our Lord Jesus, your Son, our Saviour by whom you have made your light to shine upon the world. That all who rejoice in that light, all who love and put their trust in and know Jesus as their Savior and Lord, are cleansed from sin and saved from judgment and given new and eternal life and hope. We pray, Lord our God, that as we take this bread and this wine, that you would help us to be truly thankful in our hearts for the redemption that has been won for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that by your Spirit, you would unite our hearts together and unite our hearts through faith uh, in the Lord Jesus um, and enable us to look to and truly trust in him as we partake of the table. And so, Father, we We ask, we pray all of these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. According to the example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ and for a memorial of him, we do this. The Lord Jesus, the night on which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you.
This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Take, eat, this do in remembrance of him. This cup is a new covenant in the blood of Christ, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. for many for the forgiveness of sin drink you all of it let's bow our heads in prayer let us pray Heavenly Father we Thank you for the privilege of being able to partake of the bread and the wine today as a fellowship of your people and of the people of Christ. Thank you for the assurance that we have through our Lord Jesus that we have entered into your kingdom, that we are partakers of Christ and therefore of Christ's glory. And we remember at this time, we, we, we pray for those who cannot be with us, those housebound, those in care, those sick. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your blessing would be upon them and your presence with them at this time. We remember and we pray for all who grieve and who mourn, known to us and among us, that you would comfort and be with them, and be their strength and their help. And so, Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to partake of Christ through these elements of bread and wine, and that you are with us indeed by your Spirit. And pray, Father, that as we go out of here now, that we would know and experience in our own lives the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus applied to us, that we might die to the old and live unto the new, and live to Christ to be conformed to him. We pray that you would do this for us, O Lord God, in your grace and by your mercy. And we ask these things, Heavenly Father, through and in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. again um, and uh, I'm going to be very good and put my mask on so I'm down here um, and uh, we're going to sing a, a good modern piece by a Gaddy piece uh, number 500 God of Grace Amazing Wonder so we'll worship the Lord as we sing together
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.